Hi, ever wonder what it's like to work another profession or live in the underworld? Listen to Unsuspecting Riders give a 10 to 15 minute personal masterclass as I spontaneously interview them as they enter my taxi. I'm your host, Simon Rushton, and this is Taxi Chronicles. Morning, morning, morning. Yes, we're back with another episode, another rider. Today we have Luke in the car. He's an AI guy, that's an artificial intelligence, but he's also very good on general knowledge. We've been talking about vegetarian and various other things and the reasons behind it and the cultures, and um, it's been very interesting, and I think he's got more than enough gifts to share and entertain you. So nice to have you here today, Luke. If you just hold that as a microphone. Thank you very Let's much. So Luke, tell us about yourself. What work, What kind of person were you when you were in school? When I were in school, I was I was a person that asked why all the time and used to drive my teachers crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and have you developed on that in life, did you say? Well, I chose to become a scientist, so I guess I doubled down on asking why. Um, yeah. That's, that's, that's very good. Now, we were speaking earlier about... Um, right, let me take it stages. We were speaking earlier about um, the food and vegetarian and different cultures. And you said something that I think is quite interesting about how people had to pay tribute or taxes. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. there's a village in... Yeah, this was... I, I think this is a town called Alborabalo in Puglia. Uh, and what I was told when I visited there was that those houses that are designed so that the people who own them could break the houses down very easily and build them back up and and that was because um that was because there was some foreign king that would tax them periodically maybe every year or every second year and the tax uh regulations were linked to whether you owned a house or not or the number of houses in the region, actually, I think it was. So uh, the local ruler would tell the people to break the houses down so he would not get taxed as much when the kind of the king kind of came to collect taxes. And why we came to this, this point in the conversation is because I mentioned about there's um, vegan and pescetarian and those kind of things are more of a privilege. You, you have to be privileged to be able to decide you don't want to eat meat, um, regardless of your racial background and everything. You, it's something that most people in the world can't just decide. And people eat out of convenience. And then we're discussing where vegetarianism, I think, is that right? Where yeah, it, it can yeah. come from. And then we're looking at the tax and yeah. the fact that you can hide growing crops or vegetables in the forest if you've got loads of animals running around, <laughs> yeah. the king's going to have could a be bit easier to tax. And things like that. So that was very interesting. You say you work, you're a scientist. Tell us about that. What's the route that you took to become a scientist and why? So the two things I was actually interested in in, in high school were architecture and physics. Mm-hmm. So I was a little bit torn on which one to study. Uh, but I ended up uh, doing physics because I actually didn't get good enough grades to get into architecture. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, 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 so I studied physics uh, in an undergraduate, and then I went on and, um, yeah, I did two years of kind of entrepreneurship after my degree, and then I decided to go do a, a PhD, actually, in, um, in, in physics in an area called quantum computing. What um, qualification did you get? Um, I know you're from Australia. I don't know what qualifications like we yeah. do GCSEs here in school. Yes, yes, yeah. So we have a thing equivalent to like a GCSE so, in Australia. But I was a little bit lazy in high school. So, uh, but then later on, I knew that I enjoyed kind of doing research and solving problems and things like that. So I started to work a lot harder a little bit later in life. Okay, well, yeah, you learn when you learn, as they say. Exactly. And stuff. So what would you say you learned from doing your degree that you wish you knew when you had started? Hmm. Um, 
I don't know. I, I think I think bit by bit. I maybe one of the things that I learned was that you can't always predict how life will play out, and uh, you can plan a lot to some extent, mm -hmm. and you can work hard. But I think what's kind of more for me, what's kind of more important actually is being open to opportunities and be kind of receptive to kind of opportunities. So I think like what I've seen is that different things that have kind of come along in life is, yeah, like you have to be ready to kind of be like, yeah, that's good. Or that's, an, that's something that I will like and be willing to take the courage to do it or to be able to kind of chase it, chase it down in a way. And I think like, that's kind of been a little bit of a thing that I've realized that, yeah, we can actually, if, if we take a bit of courage and we have a bit of faith in ourselves, we can kind of chase things down. And I think like that's to some extent, yeah, I would have, I would have liked to have more clarity on that earlier on, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Do you, sorry, um, your first job, what was your first job? Hmm. My first job was actually in Australia. We have um, it was in high school. Uh, we actually have the curbs at the sides of the ha uh, 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 like the houses are on the street, and often it's quite difficult to be able to see the number of the house because you know, they have a front garden and things like this. And the number is usually on the letterbox. And uh, and so so often people put uh, the house number also on the cement curb. So the curb is not square in a lot of the su newer suburbs. I'm from Perth, uh, which is Western Australia. And so I bought some stencils and I saw that some in some other suburbs there was numbers on the curbs. So I started to take those stencils and I knocked on the doors and basically said to people, would you pay me $15 to put a number on your curb? And they looked at me kind of like, do I trust this person? But actually I created a really good little business out of, yeah. out of that, of putting kind of house numbers on people's curbs. And that kind of, um, yeah, got me, got me pocket money through, that's, through high school, actually. That, that sounds very good. Very in. You can get your friends on the project, get contracts. Exactly. The whole street. Well, actually I did. Uh, so, so, um, a friend of mine from primary school saw that I was making money out of it and he said, can I help you? And I said, well, how about you, you bring me uh, contact. If you go knock on doors and find people who want this, then I'll come around and paint the house number mm. on the curve. So we started working Indeed together on it. Yeah. So, yeah. And also, you also delegated the harder part of the work. <laughs> oh, well, hey, yeah, you go off and do that. He was, he was a good salesperson. Yeah, yeah he's developing his skills and stuff. Yes. So, what was it like? You said you work in AI now. Yes. How long you worked in AI and what was that... Um, what was your first introduction to AI? So uh, I was so uh, so I did my PhD in, in in quantum computing, and that was between two thousand and one mm -hmm. and two thousand and four or two thousand and five. So that was very in the earlier days. So quantum computing is becoming a bigger thing now, uh, but back then uh, I was trying to look at ways to build a quantum computer, like like how would you actually make it work? Just for the listeners. Yes. Please explain what officially is a quantum computer. So, so in physics, uh, there is um, so the way the way the way that uh, subatomic particles or, or the way that a lot of physics works at the bottom is governed by quantum quantum mechanics, and this has kind of um, this this has. Um, prop behaviors that are, are kind of unexpected in that things can become connected to to each other so that if you change one it can affect the other uh, uh, almost instantaneously and it can kind of become one thing no? so you can take like different electrons for example uh, ele an electron is uh, has a magnetic field so it's got like a little north north pole and a south pole mm -hmm. And if you point the North Pole up, then you can call that a one. If you point it down, you might call it a zero sort of thing. No? So binary. binary, exactly. But then as soon as you connect them, 
in, 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 in or you entangle them, uh, they, the two, if you have two electrons, which each can be a one or a zero, when you entangle them, they can actually become a new thing. So rather than thinking about them separately as separate things, they actually become um, kind of a, 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 unit? A, un, a unit. And then you can add three and you can add four. And you can use the fact that they become more of a whole to, do, to be, create a more powerful computer, basically. And um, it was that property to be able to control how you connect these, how you measure these, and uh, how you build it is what I was focused on, trying to come up with ways to turn what is more theoretical ideas into something practical that could be useful. So at the end of that, I was like, the techniques to be able to control the world in that sort of way were not there back in 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. So I came to the conclusion that, well, like I can kind of keep pushing on it, but our ability to manage the world is, is, not, is not available. So I, I, I saw that like artificial intelligence is really the next frontier in science. Now to be able to understand the brain, to be able to understand how we think, um, and to try and build systems that do that. This is, this I thought, yeah, this is what we really need to kind of mm. come to grips with. Now science understands a reasonable number of other things like in, in chemistry, in physics, in kind of, um, yeah, you might even say to some things in biology as well, mm. which, but that's also an area where we're learning a lot. But I saw that artificial intelligence is kind of the next frontier. So I, so I then basically, yeah, I, I, I applied for a postdoc at Oxford at the time and then went to Oxford to do, to do a postdoc mm. uh, in artificial intelligence. Mm, yeah. And what was that like? What was your experience at Oxford like? <sighs> um, it was good. Uh, I was very, very lucky in my PhD in that I was trusted and I was allowed to work on what I wanted to work on. Yeah. And but then when I went to Oxford, I there was a lot more control there. Uh, basically, the person I was working under, um, yeah, was wanted it? to control control yeah. how I worked a lot more, and I was not so comfortable with that. Is is that because the business was financing it behind the scenes? Uh, no, the university was financing it. Um, um, is the uni like financed by a business or anything? No, no. The university is financed with government money and donations and things like this. Yeah, and that's what I'm, that's what I was thinking about the donation part. Yeah, because the donation part might they, they may want you to. Um, yeah, there's expectations, no? Like 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 when 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 if you're being given money. You have to produce and to, to, to do something. You do have to produce results, and so I think like I find this. So so now I build artificial intelligence mm. startups, and yeah, we get given investors' money, mm -hmm. and we are expected to turn that money into into something real, sort what, of thing. Now, what kind of thing would you have to develop as a artificial AI startup so one of one of our companies is uh, combining so we have we make a robot for a farm yeah. and uh, that's a little autonomous vehicle that drives along and looks at the broccoli and uh, looks at the weeds and then uh, basically shoots a laser at the weeds to kill the weeds so that really? people can do organic farming uh, for cheaper. The company's called Earth Rover, actually. So. Earth Rover. Yep, we licensed uh, some technology from the European Space Agency, and I've got a good background in lasers. So yeah, we're we we at the moment we can kill one weed a second uh, with with the laser, and um, people want to do organic farming. Basically, the alternative is to either put sprays, and we don't want necessary a lot of kind of poisons to kill the weeds or someone has to go there and weed it by hand basically yeah and that, what i'm thinking is if you've got this robot it's not yep. a drone it's actually like a like it's got wheels, wheels yeah exactly so you need to plant the crops a certain distance apart so the robot can go down the middle yeah but they've already done that because they have to get a tractor down the middle but it also runs on batteries so and and the batteries get charged with solar energy okay so, Real future, do you feel there's any area of 
of AI that humans should not go. Hmm. I, 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 I think what is really important is that there's humans in the loop or involved in the process. And so, so I, I really believe in um, something like that the robot or the artificial intelligence should, there should be people who understand it. And to some extent, there should be, it should be explainable or there should be a communication between the people and the robot. So, um, yeah, so I believe in kind of this area. There's an area in artificial intelligence called explainability. Yeah. So, so it's a little bit like you and I, I don't necessarily, uh, we can talk to each other. I can understand a little bit ar ar around what you're thinking, but, but I can't get into the details sort of thing. So I, I, I don't believe we'll ever be able to know exactly everything that is in, um, in kind of yeah like the latest artificial intelligence models mm -hmm. but i believe that we can put more work and focus more on explainability and making sure that either there's human teachers or that that the model you can do run some tests or some simulations on the model to be able to understand its limitations so think about autonomous vehicles or autonomous driving yep. this becomes really important to be able to test the models against a range of different scenarios uh, and surprising situations basically so so I'm also working on this in, an, in another company around how to work out what is surprising how to be able to share what is surprising back uh, to the mothership in a way so like you think about Tesla Tesla's cars, if their cameras see something strange, they should be they, they need to share this information back to the headquarters mm -hmm. so that that information can be used mm -hmm. to train future models, basically. Yeah. That, 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 that yeah, will, it has to continuously learn. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. So, we're coming to the end of the journey. Last quick question What is the impact you want to have in the world? <laughs> I want to like. Uh, <laughs> what is the impact? I want to leave the. I want to be proud of the things. Like when you're old and you look back on your life, I do want to kind of feel that it's a it's a life worth living and that you left the place, the world, a better place. I, I really deeply believe this, and yeah, this is what I care about. Now. And the last quick question is: If it was a young person who wanted to get into AI, mm -hmm. what would be your advice to them? Um, one, one I think is, is there's a lot of great online tools, mm -hmm. like in Coursera, there's some very good courses that people can do. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that it is important that you, you follow maths and you do, do enough maths. Uh, even if you, even if you struggle with it, keep persisting and keep pushing. You don't have to be brilliant at it. Mm -hmm. Um, and really i'm a huge believer in following what you're interested in now because like if you follow what you're interested in you'll work on the weekends mm -hmm. you'll work at night and it won't really be work but those hours add up sort of thing now so don't worry if you're not necessarily the best or the smartest or anything like this mm -hmm. but i really be am a big believer in following okay. your passions basically well thanks a lot for that thank you Simon. much appreciated and we wish you well <laughs> thank you We hope you liked that interview. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to get the latest daily episode. Ever considered investing in a continent with the fastest growing economy and population on Earth? The same continent that holds 30% of the world's known natural resources? Then listen to our sister podcast, Africa Investor Stories, where you will hear real investors with real stories from around the world share the experience of investing in Africa. We post Monday and Thursday at 10am.